Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for what you've shared with us already through your people. Thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit that ministers continuously, Lord, in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for your favor. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. Thank you for the anticipation, Lord, that we're feeling for what shall come to pass and what has already come to pass in the Spirit. And will be manifest in the flesh. Yes. We give you praise for it this morning. In Jesus' name, everybody say praise the Lord. Praise, the Lord. praise God. God bless you. You may be seated. <laughs> Welcome everybody that's uh, with us on Facebook and uh, online. We appreciate you being with us this morning. Uh, those of you that are here in person, God bless you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing. Praise the Lord. Thanks, Suzanne, for opening and sharing all that you had and Mike thank you as well and I'm not going to name you individually because there's more than two praise the Lord but thank all of you for leading us in worship and bringing us to this place amen where the Lord is ministering and blessing each and every one of us praise the Lord God's good is he yes. hallelujah amen praise the Lord Seems like there's something else I'm supposed to do, but apparently not because I don't remember it. Praise God. But God is good and He's, uh, he's working, praise the Lord. Appreciate it, like I said, everything that uh, y'all have shared and testimonies. and God is uh, ministering, praise the Lord. And I thought uh, this morning, I'm so, uh, I, I appreciate everybody sharing because it always validates what God is saying to me as well and uh, what I feel like he's wanting me to share. Is my mic on? Because I was reaching around back there and don't know what I, <laughs> what I turned on. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's all I need. So, thank God. But that's a, that's a wonderful praise God. I'm sure they're excited right now. Uh, but how many I mean just what we were talking about this morning uh, and I don't want to be misunderstood which is easy for me to do but uh, we struggle I think sometimes and I hear it from people uh, frequently how do I hear from God you know so and so seems to hear from God but I'm not hearing and I don't understand it and, and it's already been said that uh, it takes all of us hearing from God in order to to do what God wants us to do we are one body after all and uh, we need the prophets and uh, we do but prophets can't lead us 24 hours a day they give us direction they give us insight and uh, a word from the Lord about specific things but we still have to live we still have to go through our own how do I fit into that how do I fit into this prophetic word that's going forth and so on and so forth and that's what God's been dealing with me about because I think we all I know I personally there's been times when I'm thinking God I don't, I don't know your I, I'm not I'm not recognizing your voice well one thing that the Lord told me was uh, he sounds just like me yeah. <laughs> it's weird but he does you know I, he's got my voice or I've got his voice up so. you know what I mean and uh, so a lot of times, you know, we're waiting for some boom from heaven or, you know, some strange voice. I'm speaking, you know, in, in normal uh, situations. And it's just us that we're going to hear. It's he speaking to us through our own understanding, right? Yeah. I mean, he's going to talk to you, Don, in a way that he doesn't talk to me. Yeah. Can't help it. It's just we're different people. And so if he, if he spoke to me what he speaks to you, the way that he speaks to you, I, I, it, it would probably go right over my head or right through one ear and out the other because it wouldn't register. It just wouldn't fit. Because our personalities, our histories, our backgrounds, our whatever, are different. And so that's the unique thing about the prophetic. Because they have a tendency to, uh, and I'm being using general terms here, to be more sensitive to specific things that God is saying than the average person is. So what I'm saying today is not a graduation. What I'm saying is not a, a uh, 
maybe your way up here and somebody else's way down here. I'm just saying the way that we receive is different, mm -hmm. right? And that's based on how long we've been saved, maybe how much we read the Bible, how much we're in, uh, in commune with God, how much we, you know, are, are spiritually awake, I, I guess I could say. And it might also have to do with your age. I mean, people that have lived a long time have a little more experience, and so they, God can speak to them about some things maybe that they couldn't speak to a 15-year-old about. You know what I'm saying? So all of these things will come into play, so I don't want to, I don't want to sound too weird here once I get going. Praise the Lord. So let's, I, I'm going to read uh, four, just four individual scriptures here to get started with at least. And I want to start with Exodus chapter 20 and verse 2, Peter. Exodus 20 and verse 2. Thank you, Jesus. I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Deuteronomy 4, 33. Chapter 4, verse 33. This is... This could be a disco. If I, if I brush to move on you, don't blame me. It's the... Did ever people hear the voice of God speaking out of the midst of the fire? as thou hast heard and lived. Praise the Lord. Psalms 29 and verse 4. The voice of the Lord is powerful. That word also translates strength. The voice of the Lord is strength or powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Yes. Praise the Lord. The voice of the Lord is powerful or strength. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 6. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Praise the Lord. I am the Lord your God. It is written. Yes. Has a people ever heard the voice of God? Mm. Psalms 29, 4, it said, the voice of God is in his strength. Yes. So you weren't reading it either, were you? <laughs> because if Psalms 29, 4 said, the voice of God is in his strength. The world wouldn't be able to handle it. Right. Nobody would be able to handle it. If the voice of the Lord was in his strength. It'd be like an atomic bomb going off in our head. But instead it says the voice of God is in strength. Or is in power. Not in his power. In other words, it's not when God speaks, it isn't the power of God going out there, all of the power of God, or it would just it would ravish everything. Yeah. And we're talking about the God who spoke everything into existence. Yes. Right. So it's the voice of God is in strength or is in power. And that is according to the strength of each individual. The young, the old, even the, even the little tiny ones, even the little toddlers, so to speak. God said to Israel, he said, do not believe that there are many deities in heaven because you have heard many voices, but know that I alone am the Lord your God. Like it says in Deuteronomy 5 and 6, I am the Lord your God. Just because you hear lots of voices doesn't mean there's lots of gods. Right. Amen. Exodus 20 and 2 again. I am the Lord. You don't have to go there, Peter. I am the Lord your God, is what he says. I am the Lord your God. Yes. 
Notice it doesn't say, I am the Lord. Now, you can't tell by the English translation, but in the literal Hebrew, if you read it in the Tanakh or, or in the Hebrew Bible, the literal translation is, is not plural. It's not, I am the Lord your God, plural. Everybody, right? But it literally translates, I am the Lord your God, singular. So he's talking to you individually. He's talking to us individually, not as human beings or not as a race of people or not as a particular group of people, but each one of us. And the word of God spoke to each and every person according to their particular capacity. According to their strength or in the Hebrew, koho. So here's, here's, I was talking to Tammy a little bit Wednesday night before the service because I, I was trying to encourage her, uh, not just for the sake of encouraging her, but, but some things I had been reading and studying over the, the last few weeks. And one of them is how Israel, it's amazing to me, because we, we seem to kind of take, or at least I'll, I'll speak for myself, take it for granted, that Israel made a major, major thing out of teaching the young people, teaching the kids. The next generation. Whenever you walk, whenever you talk, when you're in the bed, when you're eating, whenever, whatever you're doing, talk to them about the Lord. Teach them. Tell them about what God has done for you. Now listen to this. Moses was giving this to the people of Israel. They didn't even have a written language. They, they, they couldn't read or write because they didn't have nothing to read or write. They didn't have an alphabet. They didn't have any of these things when that was done. And yet he's telling them, I want you to teach these kids this next generation, everything that there is to know about God, everything you know about God, I want them to know about God. I want them to know everything that's in the law, everything that I've promised, everything that I've declared. And the reason the Jewish people are still a people today is because of that very reason. They never stopped. In fact, the moment they had, once they developed their, their, their language and, and their alphabet and so forth, they immediately developed schools. And when, they, when these kids weren't in school, they were being taught at home. Right. And this is girls and boys back at a time when, in most cultures, women were, had no value other than, a, you know, a, like a cow or a horse or a dog or something. But they taught their kids, their girls. Their, in fact, their girls were better taught than the boys because once a boy was 13 and was bar mitzvahed, they'd usually go into a trade. They'd go into a profession. They'd still have their their synagogue teaching, but they wouldn't have it daily the way the girls would continue to. That's why you see women like Mary and, and different ones in Jesus' ministry. These were, they were well taught. They, they understood the scripture. They understood the, the Torah. So anyway, I'm just saying, one of the reasons we have the problems we have today in the United States and in any culture for that matter is we don't teach them about the Lord. Not the way we should. Now we may talk to them and we may pray for them and and some are probably better at it than others. But I mean, it, if we don't know, you know, we can say easily by looking at these things, you know, the rapture is going to take place and we'll all be out of here. Maybe not. Maybe there'll be another half dozen generations. Maybe there'll be another 200 years. We don't know what's happening. We just know what it looks like. Right. We can't just stop teaching the kids. We can't just stop telling them about the Lord because somebody's going to have to know this stuff when it does happen. Amen. So we need to be doing what God made a priority for Israel ought to be a priority for everybody. Right. They were the kind of the, the path that everybody should follow. So uh, Sunday school ought to be as important as any ministry in any church. Yeah. Right. In fact, in some ways, it ought to be the most important. Yeah. Because without it, we're the last ones. Right. It'll be done with us. Amen. Anyway, that was a sidetrack. But... Uh, talking about this, speaking to us individually. And uh, this thing, when, and when manna came down uh, to Israel, each and every person tasted it in keeping with their own capacity. I don't know if you ever noticed that or not. But as I read, there's, there's at least three, to, three that I focused on anyway, where manna was, was being given and how it tasted to the individuals that were eating it. God, and after what, right, the manna came down for you. It was the word. Jesus said, I am the manna that they were eating, you know. I'm the real manna. I'm the real word of God. 
So look at, let's look at this in Numbers chapter 11 and verse 8. Numbers 11 verse 8. Now this is the only one that doesn't, that doesn't translate literally uh, into the King James uh, the way it was written initially. And it says, the people went about and gathered it and ground in mills or beat it in a mortar and baked it in pans and made cakes of it. And the taste of it was the taste of fresh oil. Well, in the Tanakh or in the original Greek, or excuse me, the original Hebrew, it says, for infants, it tasted like mother's milk. It said that it had the, t the taste of it was like the taste of rich cream. Rich cream. So for, the, for them... For the little kids, it tasted like mother's milk. Mm -hmm. For the babies, for the infants, right? Look at Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 19. My meat also which I gave thee, fine flour and oil and honey, wherewith I fed thee. Mm -hmm. Thou hast even set it before them for a sweet savor. And thus it was, saith the Lord God. So for the young, now we heard what it was for the infants. For the young, it tasted like rich bread. It says, the choice flour, the oil, and the honey, which I provided you to eat. So it tasted like really good cornbread. Remember that there was, used to be a barbecue place over there on, this, on the west side? They had that sweet cornbread. Had, it was just cornbread, but it had like honey or something in it, man. It was great. It was as good as the barbecue. That's what it tasted like to the young people, to the, your people, praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. And then look at Exodus chapter 16 and verse 31. The house of Israel <laughs> called the name there of Banna. And it was like coriander seed, white, and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. So the old people, older than us, <laughs> praise the Lord, they tasted the manna according to their capacity, and it says the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. So each one of these groups were eating the same thing, but each one of them described it tasting differently tasted the way they needed it to taste, right. Right? right? So what was true about the manna was also equally true about the literal word of God. Yeah. Yeah. Each and every person heard it according to their own particular capacity, right. according to their own strength, right. Right? right? And that's why David said in Psalms 29 and verse 4, the voice of the Lord is in strength not the voice of the Lord is in his strength. Praise the Lord. But the voice of the Lord is in strength and the capacity of each and every person. Don't be misled, the scripture said, because you hear many voices. Know that I am one and same. I am the Lord your God. Yes. See, God is not going to humiliate one person and make one pe person feel bad because they don't hear what another person hears. He's talking. I mean, this is the beauty of God. Yes. He talks to each one of us individually. Yes. And so I may say, you know, the Lord was talking to me about this and you go, oh, well, he never said that to me. <laughs> no, but if you were to share, if you were really listening mm -hmm. and you would share what God said to you, I'd say, well, he didn't say that to me. Right. No, because he wasn't talking to me. Mm -hmm. He was talking to you. We're unique in the eyes of God. In the mind of God, we are each one his only child. Mm -hmm. And he speaks to us that specifically. Yes. So we, for us to say, well, you know, the Lord said this to me, and you go, so? Right? I mean, have you ever had what you thought? You go, wow, that was the Lord. Yeah. And then you share it with your spouse, or you share it with a friend, and they go, yeah. yeah. Okay, you're going, wow, maybe, man, maybe I missed it. I thought it, right? It's because it's for you. Yeah, yeah. It's not for them. Right. Now, maybe sometimes there's corporate things like that, but a lot of times it's just God just talking to you. He's just having a conversation with you. It has nothing to do with anybody else. 
He's trying to get intimate with you. He's trying to get close to you. He's trying to get to a place where you can hear him even when he whispers. Amen? So let me show you a, a kind of a parallel to this. Genesis uh, chapter 32 and verse 30. Genesis 32 verse 30. And this is about Jacob, you know, and he's, he, he wrestles, you know, and he says, I've seen God. I've seen the face of God here. At Peniel, it's called. And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Praise the Lord. So imagine, I mean, I've thought about that. Imagine me seeing the face of God. What in the world would that look like? You know what I mean? How... How could you even def- describe it, you know? See in the face of God. Well, now, in the Hebrew, the word face is panim, P-A-N-I-M. And I am, whenever there's an I am on a, a Hebrew word, it's a plural, like Elohim. Mm-hmm. That's, we'll create man in our image. It's, it's just plural. It's just a way of saying the same word, plural. Well, panim is plural. And what's interesting is when the Lord ends, when that word ends in M, it becomes plural. So the word face is plural. The word face there is really faces. So in Hebrew, to speak of the face of God is to speak of the faces of God. Which makes sense in a way because how are you going to capture all that God is in one mug shot. Yeah? What's a face? It's not the essence of a person. It's not who they are. I mean, we've all seen people that were really cool to look at and they turn out to be complete jerks. Yeah. Right? Bye. Beauty's only skin deep, that kind of stuff, right? It's the appearance. It's how you know. It's how you recognize somebody without them saying anything. So how do you see the face of God? By the panim, by the faces of God. You see them in, you see them in blessings. You see them uh, where he's provided for you. Where he's in love, where someone has reached out to you and 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 loved you and you know been kind, mm-hmm. done something nice. It's shown to you when when you're in need, when you have a a circumstance or a situation. Sometimes it's family, so maybe it's parents. Sometimes it's the church. Look at Numbers uh, six. Verse 24 through 27. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. And they shall put my name upon the children of Israel and I will bless them. So it's like in their loving you, he's loving you. In their helping you, he's helping you. In their encouragement, he's encouraging you. In their panim, in their different faces, the individuals, different individuals, was the panim or the faces of God being revealed, being shown. Remember, remember when Mary went to the tomb and she saw Jesus and she didn't recognize his face? Looked right at him, thought he was the gardener. And it's true for us too. It's, it's the same way in our lives. If you really look, you'll see it. If you're really looking for the Lord, you'll see him in all sorts of things. You'll see him in friendships. You'll see him in relationships. You'll see him in kind things that people do. You'll see it in blessings that come to you. You'll see it in healings. You'll see it in deliverance. You'll see it in all sorts of things. 
If you look, you actually see it. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. But if you have to look for the good, for the holy, if you have to look for the beautiful, that's when you're going to find it. And that's when you see the face of God. When you allow yourself to be used, when you allow the Holy Spirit to move on you and you respond to it and, and act on what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do, when people look at you, they see the face of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Sometimes we'd rather look like us than God. You know what I'm saying? I'd rather be right. It's just us. It's human. But, but God's wanting to be seen all the time. But we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Praise God. So back to where we were. What's it like to actually hear the voice of God? I mean, can humans actually bear that, that power, that kind of enormous weight, the, the force of God's own voice coming directly to us? And so at, at the same time, thinking of that, how can we explain all of the interpretations of the word of God? or of God's words. Right. Same God speaking, same thing, yes. and we got yeah. all sorts of interpretations, all sorts of different definitions and ideas of what it means and how, what's he saying. And I know what he's saying. No, he, he, he's saying this. No, he's not. He's, he's saying, this. you know, it's the same right. thing. It's a, he's saying the same thing, but we're all hearing something different. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Amen. Those rabbis didn't doubt that there was just one God. Believe me, they knew there's only one God. I don't care how you try to divide it up. I don't care how you try to define it. Ultimately, when we get down to the bottom line, one God, period. Amen. Amen. It's the existence of one God. But just like us, they were puzzled and still are to this day about the multiple ways we can understand the revelation of God. God gives us a revelation and we, you get one revelation, it's like a secret. Let it get around the room and you'll have, however many people are in there, you'll have that many revelations. Am I right? I mean, we've all seen it and experienced it, right? So if God speaks with one voice, how is it possible for people to hear all these different things? Why is there more than one understanding of revelation? And I think we just need to be honest about it and not be afraid that we might not agree on everything I'm talking about when it comes to revelation fear of God I'm not talking about fear of one another because we can always compromise in terms of our agreements or disagreements with God there's no compromise it's either what he said or it isn't what he said but we have to have enough courage to be honest about it in order for God to really deal with us amen so why are there all these different interpretations of scripture You need to make Jesus your personal Lord and Savior. Am I right? This is about personal stuff. This is God is about you and him, me and him. As much as it's about all of us, it's still about me. It's like, Thomas, I'm just one of the disciples, but I'm the favorite. I'm the special one. Well, and really, that's the way it is for everybody. We're all his children, but I'm the special child or you're the special child, depending on who's doing the talking, right? And that's the way God intends it to be. As weird as that sounds in a natural family, that's exactly how God wants it to be. Yes. And in a sense, that's how we want it in our families too, isn't it? Yes. You're, you're the special one. But so are you the special one. You're all, you're, you've got to realize you are unique like everybody else. 
You know what I mean? That's, what, that's the way we are with our own kids because we know each one of them, we love them the same in the sense that, I don't love this one more than that, but I love them more in the moment because it's them. And that's who the one I'm talking to. That's the one I'm interacting with, right? Yes, yes. And that's how God is with us, even on a greater scale. Praise the Lord. He's personal. And each individual receives only what he or she is able to bear or comprehend or relate to. That's one reason why the more we pursue God, the more we study the word, the more we pray, the more we see, the more we hear, the more we actually get. It isn't because he doesn't want to give us more. He's just got sense enough to know there's no point in getting out the trigonometry book when they haven't learned, you know, two plus two yet. All I'm going to do is confuse them. Amen. So God speaks to everybody with the same love, with the same commitment, but on the level that they can relate to. Mm -hmm. yes. Look at Acts. Uh, well, we don't have to go there. I think everybody's familiar with this. But in Acts chapter 9 and, and uh, 22 both is a story about Saul. And he's on the road to Damascus. And he's been, you know, doing some bad stuff. And he's on there to get letters of uh, arrest warrants, basically. And he's got some people with him. And they're traveling. And it's, what's interesting is... This, this light surrounds Saul, or it comes and blinds him, right? right? Saul and his men that are with him. They all saw the light, mm -hmm. but only Saul saw Jesus. They were all right there. They were all in the same place. They all saw this bright light, but nobody saw Jesus except Saul. They all heard something. They all said they heard something. But only Saul heard a distinct word. They were all hearing noises, but they didn't know what the noises were. But Paul actually heard words. Paul said, I heard a voice saying to me. Praise the Lord. That's the way it is. We, how many times have you ever been in a church service and you're going, my God. And the person sitting next to you, what's the matter? Got a headache? You all right? No, you're hearing something that they're not hearing. He's saying it, but you're hearing it different than somebody else heard it. And it doesn't just have to be in a church service. It can be anywhere. You can sometimes, you just be listening to a song on the radio. And it may be some old rock and roll song. It could be anything. And all of a sudden, you're hearing God. You're hearing him actually speak through some song that... You know, everybody else would go, are you crazy? I hated that song when it was popular. <laughs> but not, uh, look, Psalms 95, verse 7. And I'm telling you these things because this is what God, what I'm asking God about for me. I've, I've been living for God for a long time. Not that well at times, but living for him anyway, nevertheless. And I've struggled from time to time. God's done things for me in spite of me. Right. And he's shown me things and given me promises. But there have been gaps. Yeah. And I'm thinking, how, why? I mean, surely it isn't because you haven't wanted to talk to me. It's simply because I'm not listening or else I'm not hearing what it is you're saying. Right. And recently... It's, it's become almost an obsession with me to hear God, to know that we're communicating here somehow, that's, that, you, that you're talking to me, right? And I, I'm not content with just hearing somebody else's interpretation of that. I'm grateful for it. Don't misunderstand me. Now, I'm not, listen to me. I'm not talking about Suzanne. I'm not talking about prophets. So don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm saying personally. It's not enough for me to turn on a Christian television show and, and have them tell me God's doing. I, I, hey, I'm here in Colfax, Iowa, you know, rural route. 
I, I need to hear God. I need for me, for my spouse, for my kids, for my grandkids, for my great grandkids. I need to know about what I'm doing and what you're doing with me and what the future holds for me and mine, as well as the church corporately. But if, I'm, if I fail there, I'm a failure no matter where I succeed anywhere else, in my mind. So he is our God. And we are the pasture, or the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. There's a Jewish story. I read this the other day. And this guy, he's saying, when's the Messiah coming back? When is the Messiah coming back? He's praying. He's asking God. He's saying, when will the Messiah come back? And he hears this. Today. So, later on in that same day, that evening... He comes to a prophet and he said, he lied to me. He said, what? He told me he would come today. But he hasn't come. And the prophet said, he didn't lie. What he said was, today, if you will hear my voice. Praise the Lord. Today, if you will hear my voice. And I think that's where we are a lot of times. Yeah. He'd do some stuff today if I'd hear his voice. Yes. If I was really in tune, I'd be seeing some things. I'd be hearing some things. I'd be experiencing some things. But each one of us hears with a different ear. And that's why we can't judge each other. You, you can't just say, well, you know, I, I know this and they don't know that, so they must be dumb. No. We, we, you're not hearing with this ear or this one. Right? And I'm not hearing with yours. And, and by that I simply mean what I said to begin with. We all have different, I don't care. You can be married for 50 years, 40 years, 60 years, whatever. You still are not, you still don't think the same, even though you may say that what the other person's going to say sometimes before they say it. You still have your own way of thinking. Right. And, it, and we know that they don't always jive or we wouldn't have the issues we have half the time. Right? I mean, if we all thought the same, we'd go, oh, that's cool. Yeah, you're right. No, we don't think the same, and that's why we're not always right. Praise the Lord. Everybody hears with a different ear. And God is like this. He's like the, uh, the master orator, where he can get up there and, and speak to this huge crowd of, you know, thousands, whatever. And yet each listener walks away thinking he was talking just to me. Amen? And it's like God is talking to a multitude of people. Just think about when he was at, on, at Mount Sinai. How many, uh, they say there were millions, I don't know, but there were lots of people there at the foot of Mount Sinai. And remember, he used this singular pronoun, I am the Lord, your God. So there's millions of people out there, but they understood based on the language that he used, the, the singular pronoun there, he was talking to me. Yes. Crowding all around, all kinds of people there, but he's talking to me. Yes. Amen. God is in fact talking directly to each individual. Yes. Each person hears and sees something to some degree unlike what anybody else around them is going to hear and see. And we shouldn't be freaked out about that. We ought to go praise the Lord. We ought to be rejoicing in the fact that we're not hearing exactly the same thing. Or else we would be like robots. He created us. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but in his image. So he, he speaks to us as each one of us is able in keeping with our own individual capacity to understand. Think Moses, the first time Moses heard God speaking to him was at the burning bush. Look, Exodus chapter 3, verse 6, Peter. And this is another thing that the, uh, the rabbis talk about. But I think it's interesting. And to me, it really spoke to me personally because like I was talking about me. How do I hear God? I hear me. You know why? 
because I'm comfortable with me. Yeah. Right? I mean, some people might hear a booming voice. Hey, the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Get out there and do To me, I wouldn't be comfortable with that at all. What I'm comfortable with is the sound of my own voice. It doesn't freak me out. It's what I'm used to. And I'll, I have sense enough to know there are times when I have to discipline myself and say, I'm going to do this. I don't want to do it, but I'm going to do it anyway, even when it's my own voice. So the God knows how to talk to me mm -hmm. by using my voice, knowing that I'll respond quicker to that than I will to something alien to that. It doesn't mean that he can't, you know, usurp that at times and just come in and say however he wants to do it. But for me, it's, it's my voice. It's, it's, I'm hearing me talking. Because he knows that's what I'll respond to the quickest. Because yeah. I'm bullheaded and I'm stubborn and I don't listen to anybody. No, I don't know whether that has anything to do with it or not. But moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. Now it sounds like he's saying, I am the God of thy father. Who is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? But here's what they say. It sounded like the voice of Moses' father, Amram. Because Moses, think about this. We, we look at Moses and we think, but this mighty man that led millions out of Egypt and, you know, split the Red Sea and brought on the plagues and all this other stuff. But he was a novice as a prophet. He'd never been a prophet before. He didn't know any of this stuff, right? So God thought, if I reveal myself to him in a loud voice, I'll freak him out. He'll be terrified. And if I talk in a soft voice, then he won't take the prophecy seriously enough to do what it is I'm trying to get him to do. So God reveals himself in the voice of his own father. hear my voice right Moses heard what he was capable of hearing he didn't have a long history of dealing with God he'd been an Egyptian he'd been an Egyptian until just recently prior to this when he had gotten to be with his family some and so on and then he was exiled because he killed the Egyptian guy so the voice of God corresponds to the need and to the strength of Moses. As he's out there tending his father-in-law's sheep, God is going to speak to him in a way that he won't run away from or ignore. And at that point, Moses, think about it. He's been out here in the desert for 40 years. He's lonely. He fled Egypt after killing that Egyptian. Amen. And he's exiled from everything that he knows. Yes, he's got a family there, but everything else about his life, everything about him is back in Egypt. His parents, his siblings, his people, right? Egyptian and Hebrew. All of his life, everything was back there. So even though he has a spouse and he has a couple of kids here, he's still lonely. He's lonely for home. What, you know, home is not necessarily geography. You all know that. I mean, it's just where everybody is, where everything is, right? So he's exiled from everything that he's known, whether it's the Egyptians or whether it's the Hebrews. He's longing for, for familiar voices. He's looking for something to remind him, right? So when God speaks, what Moses hears is the sound of his father's voice. It's like calling him back home. God knows how to get him to do what he needs him to do. He needs him to get back to Egypt. But he's, on the one hand, he misses, he's homesick, right? But he's scared at the same time because he knows there's a warrant out for his arrest for murder. Amen. And so he's freaked out, but yet God knows exactly how to speak to him. Yes. 
So he speaks to him in a way that pulls him back to family. Look, this is more about just going and delivering the people. It's about reuniting mm -hmm. with your family. It's, it's being, again, with them. It's, it's, it's the ultimate purpose for your life, right? So if he's going to go home, if he's going to return to his people, if he's going to lead him out of bondage, the voice that he desperately needs to hear is a voice that just says, come on back. Mm -hmm. We miss you. Mm -hmm. We want you. We need you. Mm -hmm. Right? Not the, thus saith the Lord, you know, like Cecil B. DeMille's thing. Mm -hmm. God knows how to get your attention yeah. in a way that will motivate you in ways that nobody else can. Right. And that's how he wants to talk to you. You know, we, there, there's no question we understand there are uniform laws and uh, truths in terms of God's word. But there are, as true as that is, there are different textual interpretations. Otherwise, we wouldn't have 50,000 denominations and we wouldn't have arguments within denominations, right. <laughs> right? I mean, we know that there are absolute truths here. We know that there are uniform laws and yet, we have all kinds of interpretation, interpretations of those very things. So here's the, I'm assuming, if no one person can bear to hear the direct and powerful divine voice of God itself, if all of that we hear, if everything that we hear from God is somehow refracted in a sense, or, you know, sifted down a little bit to where it's not just total power and authority. How? And this is what got me this morning. Because it's exactly what you guys were saying. It's through the corporate voices. It's your voice. It's your voice, it's your voice, it's your voice, it's my voice. It isn't God blasting at us. It's the voice of God being refracted mm -hmm. to each one of us and then us, each one, sharing that back yes. to make the whole. Yes. Without it being that force that it would be if God just blared it out of heaven and blew the building apart with us in it. So it's, it, it's so critical. That's part of the you know forsake not the assembling of yourselves together you want to hear God the more we have here the more of God we hear the clearer his voice becomes and it's not because he's taken anything away from each one of us no he's giving us exactly what we need as individuals but it can't be enough for all of us that's why we have all of us And partly it's also so that for all of us that listen and are listening to the voice of God, nobody can assume textual arrogance. No one can just say, I'm going to tell you what this says and right. you're going to believe it. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. I'm not going to question their, you know, their motive. I'm just going to say it's not possible. If it were, he wouldn't want all of us. Right. How, I, I mean, this stone written document, this by the hand of God, by the pen of God, my life has, even when I was, when I was adhering to this, to the best of my ability, to the best of my understanding, it still has gone. Why? Because what was true 35 years ago, I found to not be necessarily true 10 years later. Right. What I was positive was a revelation, right. total revelation, at 40, I found out at 45, was just a piece of something that I had tried to make a total revelation. And isn't that the case with humanity? Because every church within, within 
you know, uh, Protestantism, or you could say with any religion for that matter, but strictly within, for certainly within Protestantism, the reason we have so many is because each one got a revelation and they were sure that they had the full revelation. Yeah. And so well, let's build a church. Right. Well, then another revelation comes along. They go, no, no, we got our revelation. We're not going there. So you got to start another church and then another church and another church. And it was never God's intention to have all these churches. There wasn't even supposed to be denominations. They were just believers. Right. Think of the revelation that would ha we would have had it been corporately where we could have shared it with one another right. and built on it. That's what, he ha that's what he wants to do in every group, in every congregation, or in every fellowship, however you want to describe it. For us to get all the revelation. I need your revelation. I need your revelation. I need your revelation. No, I don't have it. Yeah, you do. You're just, you're, you're just not conscious of it. You're just not using it. Because you're measuring yours with somebody else's and saying, oh, but they've got this revelation. That revelation may not mean sick them if they don't get yours right. to balance it, right. to make total sense out of it. That's true. What we know of God is what we need at that moment in order to sustain the journey that he has for us. So yeah, maybe I needed some really wild revelation 35 years ago. Because without it, I'd have never got to where I am today. Even though I don't have all revelation, it was a motivator. It was a thing to tell me, wow, there must be more. There, maybe there's more. This was awesome. I never dreamed it could be that. Right? right. And that's what he does. It isn't, it isn't the end all and the be all, but it's to keep us moving on the journey, to keep us moving in the direction that he's trying to get us to. Yes, Lord. It's, a, it's a partial knowing. Now, I, I started to say this earlier. Since we're created in the, in the image of God, right? All human beings are created in the image of God, right? right. And none of us look alike. Right. Duh. I mean, even identical twins, there's always something. Maybe the, only the two of them know it, but there's always something that differentiates right? So it, it, we're all in the image of God, and yet none of us are alike. Go figure. How does that work? Nobody looks like the other ones. Because maybe God knew I was going to preach this one day, so he did it like this. <laughs> because it's required to look into faces, the faces of all people, in order to catch a glimpse of the vastness of God. You can't find it. You know, I mean, that's, I think, the weird thing about when you have, uh, you know, so-and-so's healing ministry. Mm -hmm. It just narrows God down to this mm -hmm. one little weirdo. Mm -hmm. Right? And God's trying to say, look out there. There's the healing ministry. There's the deliverance ministry. It's what Suzanne was saying this morning. It's what y'all were talking about. It takes every one of us to reveal God. In order for the fullness of God to be manifest, in order for us to see true healing ministry, we need to see all of God's face. We need to see all of that he is. And, and that takes every one of us to do it. Praise the Lord. So individuals from the very young to the very old, every one of them provide a different insight into the divine word. I think of my, great, my granddaughter, Izzy, when she wanted a little sister, she was only what, six, five? And she had two brothers. So you can understand her fervency in prayer <laughs> for her sister. She was praying for her sister, and she's five years old. Nobody told her, eh, you don't pray for sisters, you know, like, just talk to mom and dad. Maybe they'll work something out for you. Yeah. No, she wanted a sister, and she prayed, and she got one. Yes, she did. In fact, she got 
two. No, she got one. Yeah, she did. She got two sisters and another brother. I don't know what she was praying, but I'm sure Allison would like to know. Don't do that anymore. But anyway, I'm just saying, little kids can hear from God. And, and older people can hear from God. We just hear different. But it, what she heard from God was enough to motivate her to pray and believe that God would answer her prayer yeah. as a five-year-old. Yeah. And what did God do? He answered the prayer. So we can't say, well, the little kids, you know, they don't know what they're doing. Sometimes those kids can usher a move of God quicker than an adult will right. simply because they don't question it. They just, they, okay, let's do this. Yes. And I think we're moving into a time when we're going to see kids praying for other kids and praying for adults and we're going to see people get healed. We're going to see deliverances take place. The Spirit of God is the same in all of us. Praise the Lord. So if there's no contradiction of Scripture itself, then it's necessary that we take seriously every interpretation. I know that sounds like compromise, but I'm just saying, if, there, if there's no contradiction of Scripture, if Scripture is Scripture, and we know that it is true, it's just a question of how we interpret it, right? So then, if that's the case, then it's going to be necessary that we take seriously every interpretation in order to approximate the voice of God. Yes. Now, we'll know, we'll know if it's insane. Right. You know, it's like, yeah, we'll drink the Kool-Aid and we're all going to go out here and take our clothes off and set fire to one another in the street. <laughs> I think God told me that. Yeah, right. yeah. Probably not. <laughs> you know, that may be a special group thing, but I'm a small group thing, maybe. But I'm not part. You know what I'm saying. We have, we're not idiots. But it takes all of these to get this full picture of God. To be able to hear this approximate voice that is beyond hearing. That's too much for him to just say it without destroying everything in the process. Mm -hmm. To receive something near this direct and powerful and divine voice. Yes. Yes. He had a plan. Yeah. Don't you know his plans work? Yes. A whole body, one brain, one mind, one head, and if I can get this whole body to function together, to work in cooperation, no telling what can happen. The world's never seen it yet. That's why in the last days, greater works than these will you do. He's bringing us to places that we've only dreamt about and talked about and thought about almost, you know, like it was science fiction or something. But it's God's voice to each one of us is what he's dealing with now. Exodus uh, chapter 19, verse 16. And I'm, I'll be done here in a second. Exodus 19, verse 16. And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Right? right. Third day in the morning. Thunders, lightnings, a thick cloud. Now this is Sinai, right? What the people heard was not thunders, it was voices. Mm -hmm. Amen? The Hebrew word there is kolot, K-O-L-O-T, it's voices. What they were hearing was voices. Glory. The people were confused because there were so many voices, they couldn't dis dis you know, uh, differentiate between one from another. It's like, you know, you hear a mob scene and just rah, 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 rah. There's people talking. You just can't understand what they're saying because it's just there's so many voices going on there. And that's what this that's what they're saying. This was it, it sounded like thunders. It, it, it looked to them to be thunders. And only because there were so many voices, they couldn't figure out what it was. 
Amen? So they were confused. And they were confused at the word of God. It was God talking. But there were so many voices coming from God because he was talking to each one individually. It sounded like thunder. Amen? It sounded like it was coming from every direction. Because it was. But instead of it being something that draw the people to God, it scared them away. They ran away. Mm-hmm. We're not going near that place. Uh, this is freaking us out. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. But look at Acts chapter 2, verse 5 through 13. That kept God from them. They were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. All of these different nations, different languages. Now when that, this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Sounds like Sinai, doesn't it? They were, they were confused. They were confounded. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born. So these are all Galileans. How, how are they talking in all these different voices? Yeah. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers of Mesopotamia, and in Judea, Cappadocia, and Pontus, and Asia, Phygra, Pamphylia, Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what the heck is this? <laughs> right? They're similar. The people are hearing the language of all these nations at Pentecost. And they were confused, they were overwhelmed, and they were amazed. Yes. But God drew near. Yes. Praise the Lord. Numbers chapter 11, verse 29. And you know why? Because of the Holy Spirit. Yes. Yes. The difference between Sinai and the book of Acts. Mm-hmm. Moses said unto them, now this is back at Sinai. Moses is saying, envious for my sake, thou for my sake, would God, because the Spirit of God came upon him, right, for him to do what he did. And he said, you're, you're jealous of me or you envy, uh, you're envious because of me. I would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon all of them. That was the that's why people were running away from those voices that sounded like thunder. Right. Where just the opposite happens uh, at Pentecost because the spirit came on them and into them. And what was causing them confusion and fear and chaos actually pulled them to God and began to translate what the Spirit of God was saying. All the voices of God that He was speaking, they understood. Amen? Luke chapter 24, verse 44 through 49. And this will be the last scripture. Luke 24, 44 through 49. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among the all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. But tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Mm -hmm. He says, you want to know what all this is about? Mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's that simple. All the interpretations, all of the translations, all the 
It's all about Jesus. Though we may disagree, though we may have problems coming together to find that interpretation, this interpretation, that translation, this translation, the bottom line is, it's just about Jesus. We, it, we don't have to be afraid to miss it a little bit over here, miss it a little bit over there. My, ter- my translation isn't your translation. My interpretation isn't exactly yours. As long as we come to the bottom line, this is about Jesus yes. and the Spirit of God moving in this last day. God will honor it. Yes. Amen? Yes. Not many gods, but many voices. Yes. And the Lord said to tell you, listen, he's talking to you. Give the Lord a hand this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're hearing. Yes. And you're hearing specifically for you. And that voice that you're hearing is part of a larger voice that needs to come together with all of us. If you're out there online or if you're uh, part of this church, listen, your voice counts because you're speaking for God. And you need to share that with each and every one of us as we want to share with you. That brings the fullness of God, the many voices of God, into one tune, into one accord. Amen? Amen. And when you look around, you look in your mirror, Mm -hmm. and what you're seeing are the many faces, the panim of God. Mm -hmm. Because it takes all of us to make up that reality here on earth. Amen? Celebrate what God's doing for you and what he has done and what he intends to do in the future. Listen to what he's saying, and don't be afraid to share it. In Jesus' name. God bless you all. You're dismissed. In Jesus' name. Have a great week.